Welcome to the Self-Publishing School Podcast. This is the podcast to listen to if you're an aspiring writer or an author who wants to sell more books. On this show, you'll learn how to write and launch a book successfully, all from people just like you and from the most successful authors on the planet. I'm your host, Chandler Bolt, the founder of Self-Publishing School, the author of my new book called Published, and the CEO of selfpublishing.com. For free training on how to publish a book that sells 10,000 copies, go to selfpublishing.com forward slash Hey, Chandler Bolt here, and joining me today is Tiffany, the budget nista Aliche. Uh, she's an award-winning teacher of financial education and is quickly becoming uh, America's favorite personal financial educator. Uh, maybe you've seen her on her Netflix documentary. We'll talk about that later. Uh, pretty interesting. Um, the budget nista is also a best-selling author of a bunch of books, including The One Week Budget, Get Good at Money, which if you're watching this on the YouTube channel, you can see that book over her right-hand shoulder there. Uh, and then uh, the Live Richer Challenge series um, through her company. It's called The Budget Nista. You may have guessed. Um, she's created a financial movement that's helped over a million women worldwide. And these stats are crazy. Two, Two million. million. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. This has changed even since this since this information that I got here. Uh, and so maybe these numbers have changed too. It's helped over 2 million women. And the stats on my end say save more than two, 200 million and pay off over a hundred million in debt, purchase homes and transfer the way that they think about their finances. Uh, this is going to be a really fun one. Uh, we're going to talk about books. She's even got a children's book. We're going to talk yes. about Netflix documentary. How do you do that? She's got a really cool quiz. A lot of times we talk about quizzes and books and using that to grow your email list. Her yep. quiz been take, has been taken by almost 100,000 people. So we'll dive into that. A lot, of, a lot of things to look forward to. Tiffany, great to have you here. Great to be here. This is awesome. I, I got your package in the middle of your, your self-publishing package. I was like, this is cute. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Awesome. That's like, that's what we, we surprise people when they sign up. Uh, and work with us. We send them that. It's kind of like yeah. the, the 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 care package. That's fun. I'm glad you liked it. Um, tell me why books. You've published a ton of books. Why are they such a big part of kind of your business and your brand? Um, honestly, the first book, the one week budget, was kind of accidental. I no no that one week budget was actually very intentional. So many people were asking me the same questions about how do you create a budget. And I was a school teacher for ten years, and I knew how to write lesson plans and things. And I thought, well, maybe I'll just like put it together in this physical kind of like a, a, a basically a really big lesson plan. So everyone could stop asking me the same questions. <laughs> And so I didn't think that I didn't really have any expectations for the one week budget, but I self-published it. And I remember it sold a hundred copies its first month. And I naively thought that like, oh, like this is what it's going to be. It'll sell a hundred every single month. I'm going to be great. Um, but then the next month it sold like two. And then every month after that, it sold zero, you know? And so it just, what the one week budget taught me how to market though, because uh -huh, I remember yeah. thinking like, I worked too hard to mm -hmm. get this information out there because as a teacher, a book is an extension of me being able able to teach. That's why I love books so much. Um, and it's like me being able to teach and it's my best. So something that I might forget to tell you, I mm. likely have put it in the book. You mm. know, it's a point of reference that when I'm not with you, you can pull it off the shelf and still get Tiffany. Um, uh, yeah. And so, yeah, that first book taught me how to market. And um, and since then, I mean, ugh, I think I'm on book like seven or something like that. Like, yeah, I just mm -hmm. been a book writing machine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so a couple follow-ups there. So you talked about, I mean, I love, a lot, we talk about the broken record conversations. It's like, what are you, the things that you keep getting asked about and how that, a lot of times that's a great first book. So it's kind mm -hmm. of cool to hear uh, your experience there. How did that book teach you how to market? Well, because so I'd gone to school. So I have my bachelor's in um in business with a concentration in marketing. And then I went on to get my, my master's in education. And I just never worked outside of some internships that I hated in business. So I never really dusted off my marketing acumen. But I just remember feeling like I'd worked so hard on this book. I'm not going to let it languish. You know what I mean? It was just like, no, yeah. like I busted my behind for two years for this. But I'm like, there's no way that people are not going to get this book in their hand. Mm -hmm. And so two years after the book came out, like I spent two years to learn. I Anybody who had a book, I asked them the same questions. How many, you know, how do you sell your book? What tools and resources have you used? And I, mm. I built my own site. Um, mm. I started, social media had just started to become a thing um, because the book was written like over like about 15 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't even have uh, business pages on Facebook, but I changed my personal page to Tiffany, the budget needs to Aliche. And I started mm -hmm. to use the personal page, like the way people use business pages now. Yep. Um, 
Um, I used to post a tip a day that nobody cared about for the first like six months. And I learned how to, because people weren't paying me to speak, but I learned how to use speaking engagements to leverage like, hey, I'm an expert. You see me here speaking, you should get my book. So there were all yeah. these things that like it, it taught me. And after two years, the book started to sell. And I remember mm. one of the best pieces of advice someone gave me, because at the time my the physical book was like, I don't know, maybe like 12 bucks or something like that. And then the ebook was eight bucks. And because in my mind, I'm like, well, it's still the same book. I'm not going to discount it tremendously. And then I met another writer and I told him my book is not selling. And he asked me my price point and he was like eight bucks. That's high for an ebook. I'm like, but it's the same book. Why should it be less? Like so much less. And he said, well, I want you to look in your category, like the finance category in Amazon. And I want you to look at the top 10 books. What are they selling for? And it was like all, everything was under five bucks. And he was like, mm -hmm. are you better known than those people on that list? And I was like, it was, you know, Dave and Susie. And, and I was like, no, he was like, so then why <laughs> would somebody pay eight for you when they could pay five for Dave? Yeah. And so I said, he said, how about this? Do like a, um, a mini sale and see what happens. So I dropped the book price to $3.99 and I posted on all my social. By then I had got like a nice cadence going. I posted, mm -hmm. I said, the book is half off at $3.99 for the next three days. And it hit the list, number one on like the, the, the finance list on oh, Amazon. Wow. And I was mm -hmm. like, pricing, that was the one mm -hmm. thing I had not considered. It, that sale has been going on for the last 15 years. It has never, I've never brought the price <laughs> back up. And so the book has just done well since then. But yes, like it, but I'm so grateful for the one week budget because it taught me so much of what it looked like to engage the audience, to get mm. them excited, to get them to purchase and buy. And I just learned so much from that book. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. And glad you stuck it out because a lot of people will just move on to the next book. It's mm -hmm. like, all right, cool. This one didn't sell. Maybe I just need to write the next one versus, uh, you know, learning the marketing, continuing to market over a long period of time. Any idea how, any idea approximately how many copies of that book has, has been sold over time? Yeah, because I had to do like, a, so I, I got my first traditionally published book deal maybe like two years ago and that they asked that question and it was about 50,000 copies, but over the last, you know, like 10 years. So it wasn't, you know, this is not some runaway hit. I mean, although relatively speaking, the average book never sells over 2000 in its lifetime, oh, yeah. you know, but you know, like my book now, it's only the um, get good with money. We sold like 230,000 in two years. So relatively speaking to that, you know, it was a slow go, but yeah, about 50,000 copies of that first book. Mm, wow. So from, from hundreds of copies sold in the first couple of years mm -hmm. to 50,000 copies sold of the first self-published book. Mm -hmm. And then now 230,000 copies sold in two years of the newest book. Do you see That's how you incredible. jump knowledge, right? So it's like, it's, it, I love it. I call it the knowledge jump. So, uh -huh. you know, you hear people say Chandler, like the first million is the hardest, like as far as making yep. money, because there's so much knowledge you have to acquire. And then, so it took me like seven years to make my first million dollars in business. And then it took me two years after that to make my first $10 million in business because there, there was a knowledge jump. Like I had collected enough knowledge. So the same thing with the book, it's like, I had learned all of these things. It took forever to get my book to do well. So by the time this book came out, I had already written like an, an additional five books. Like the next book I wrote was the literature challenge. And that was, I'm always accidentally getting success. I created this online challenge and my goal was to have 10,000 specifically women sign up to do this, um, this free three week course that I was launching in January about personal finance. And it was really just my give back to my community. And before the challenge came out, the people kept asking, how can I access it? I said, it's going to be a blog challenge where every day you'll get a blog post telling you what to do about your money. And, um, a couple of like, um, older women reached out to me and said, I don't, I don't want to like look on the blog. And I'm like, well, that's where it is. They're like, can you put it in a book? And there I was like, if I put it in a book, you have to pay for it. And they were like, okay. And it took me like weeks for like the aha to come up. Cause they kept asking, I'm like, why would you want to pay for something that I'm giving you for free? Take it for free. And they were mm. like, Tiffany, I want a book. I said, fine. I, I paid a college student to put it together and like oh, the challenge, the, the, the three week challenge and into this book, I uploaded it to Amazon and it sold $10,000 worth of books month one. I couldn't believe it. I was like, you're kidding. So it was this aha moment of like, you know what, instead of just kind of throwing a book out there, you know, maybe if you can attach it to this existing movement and make the book a resource to the movement, the movement is free. The book costs money. I couldn't believe it. So then every challenge after that, those books have sold really well. Cause I've done five challenges, yeah. um, the, the savings edition, credit edition, home buying edition, and the book, I actually don't market the book as far as traditionally. So I market the free challenge that you sign up for. And then mm. every day during the challenge, it says, Hey Chandler, if you really liked the challenge, challenge and you want it in physical form, you can get the book. That's and cool. so it just like allows that book to sell without any stress for me. Wow. That's incredible. I was wondering about that because I'm looking on Amazon and, and yeah, it's, you've got, let's see the live richer challenge credit edition. Mm -hmm. That's got 672 reviews on Amazon. Mm -hmm. You've got live richer challenge savings edition. Mm -hmm. Like you said, 379 reviews, home buying edition, 247 
seven reviews, uh, net worth edition. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I need to read that one. Um, <laughs> that's a big focus. I'm like, I'm, I'm really learning a lot about growing net worth. That's fun. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really interesting. You're the only person I've ever seen that's done books from their challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and literally when I say it's copy paste from the challenge and everyone knows, like I'm very transparent mm -hmm. with the audience that this is just a physical version of what you get for free on the blog, but some people just mm -hmm. want it in hand. And what, if you, the way I lay out my books, I like a formulaic book because my books are how to. Mm -hmm. And so I lay it out the way I would lay out a lesson plan. Here's what you're going to learn. Here's the objective. Here's how to rock this task. This is what it looks like. Here's a place to practice. So I'm literally just being my teacher self and people love it. Like if I look at my comments, the, the number one comment is always, it was so easy to follow and understand. So then when I got my first traditionally published book deal, I, you know, I put all of this knowledge that I learned together and I put it into that, um, into that book. And, and even between that, so I wrote a children's book called Happy Birthday, Molly Moore. I'm going to hold it up. Yeah. For you, right. And so this one, I said, I didn't want to publish it the, the typical way. I said, is it possible for me to do a hybrid of self-publishing and, but also have helping with help with distribution. And so I did that. I found a hybrid company that helped me to do that. And I, um, someone suggested to me that I kick it off with a Kickstarter. Oh, and that was like genius. Mm -hmm. I had never done a Kickstarter before. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to raise $30,000. And I said, you know, I'll, with $30,000, if you buy, if you donate up to $30, you get the book, but then you also get to donate a book to a class. Classroom. And we raised like $70,000 on the Kickstarter. Um, and it was amazing, but it was such a great learning lesson there too, a different way to market. So what I've really learned about marketing is if you can tie it to a thing beyond the book yeah. itself. So it's like, mm -hmm. oh, I want to support this Kickstarter, but the Kickstarter helps to sell the book. I want to mm. join this literature challenge, but the challenge helps to, to, to sell the book. And for this, it was really like the, the quiz helped tremendously. Like, you know, people took the quiz and they're like, and the quiz helped to like uh, sell the book. That's great. That's really great advice. So it's, it's make almost kind of like making making your book into a movement by attaching yes. it to something bigger. Yes. Challenge, Kickstarter campaign. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's that's really interesting. It sounds like one of your secret weapons is your experience as a school teacher yes, and the ability to create lesson plans. Any mm -hmm. advice for other school teachers who are thinking about uh, writing and publishing books? Yes. Yeah, so well, first of all, I want to say that you are totally a badass if you're a school teacher. I think you're probably undervaluing all that you bring to the table because you are the principal, you're the nurse, you're the counselor, you're the teacher, you're the mom, you're the dad, you're all those things at the same time and somehow manage to get your kids to a place of, of no knowledge to knowledge or mm. less knowledge. To, like, I yeah. don't think teachers understand how powerful the tool they have, you know, like, because it is really hard to get people to know a thing that they do not know. Mm -hmm. And so like, I lean yeah. heavily into that. And so all of my books are written with this formula of here's the lesson, here's how it looks done properly. Here's a place for you to do the lesson. And when I tell you, People love it. Um, whether you're a doctor, a mechanic, or whatever, people want to be handheld when they don't know how to do something. Mm, you know, like yeah. not handheld in a way that um, you know, makes them feel like you know you're talking down to them, but handheld. They don't want to figure it out. They're like, oh, Tiffany's telling me exactly what to do, how to do it, when to do it. And so, as a teacher, lean into your ability to teach and create these lesson plans. And if you're, you know, of course, if you're writing like a, a novel or something, that's something different. But if you're writing how-to books, you know, yeah. you already know how to teach. Lean into it. Mm -hmm. Let people know that you're a teacher. Like if you look mm -hmm. at my reviews, I have over almost 5,000 reviews on Get Good With Money. It's only two years old. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority are five star, mm -hmm. you know, like 90% or something like that, mm -hmm. or 70 or 80%, something crazy. And the reviews are so similar. It was so easy to read. It was step-by-step -step guidance. Mm -hmm. um, and that's intentional. Also too, when I wrote Get Good With Money, I was intentional because the teacher in me, so you want to lean into your special teacher, um, like kind of like um, intuition, knows that it's kind of a chunky book. And I knew that not everyone was going to want to read it beginning to end. So I was mindful that the book does read beginning to end, but each chapter is almost its own separate book. That took a lot of work because oh, there are going to be people, yeah. you know, who are like, I just want to know how to budget. You go to the budgeting mm -hmm. chapter, it's enough. It exists mm -hmm. in its own universe, but it also exists within savings and debt. If you yeah. just want to learn about investing, you don't necessarily need the budget chapter if you have a budget. And so mm -hmm. I was mindful with this book that I understood how students were going to, like my readers, which I consider like my students were going to probably use the book, jumping to chapters that they want. So I didn't want them to have to feel like, oh, I have to read all of this just to get to the chapter that I want. So the book mm -hmm. reads like a timeline, but also individual mini books inside. And so I'm only able to think like that Chandler, because I was a teacher, right? You know, so leaning yeah. into the fact that like, you understand how people learn, lean into that. That's really cool. I love that. We have a bunch of teachers that come work with us to write children's books. So it's kind of mm -hmm. cool uh, seeing your experience, not only, I mean, obviously you've written and published a children's book, but also applying the classroom to more traditional um, adult books if you will. I think that's really cool. And then 
You're totally right. I'm looking right now on <laughs> Get Good With Money. I'm like, oh my gosh, these reviews are insane. Yes. 4.9 out of five star average. And then just scrolling through all the top ones. I mean, it's just, and a lot of them are, they're just rolling in. I mean, yes. the book launched two years ago and it's like a bunch of the ones in the top reviews are January of this year, February mm-hmm. of this year. I mean, this is really good. Cool. So let, let's ask about that. I, mm-hmm. I was going to ask you about that anyway. What 5,000, almost 5,000 reviews. How'd you do it? Anything, anything special that you've seen that works to get, um, get reviews? So key thing is that you want to get your community going before your book comes out. You know, like I spent years like building community around other things. Like the, the challenges are a great place to build community because people are like, you know, like it, challenges allow me to pour into the audience. They're free. They're a tool, they're a resource, but I also get to collect your name and your email and I get to bring you into the world of Tiffany. This is how I speak. This is how I teach. This is how, you know, like it, it gets you acclimated to like, do I like Tiffany? Let me stay here. I named my community dream catchers. And so by the time the book came out, I had been pouring so much into the dream catchers that when the book came out, they were like, um, I'm excited about it because I said, this is an accumulation of all I've been trying to teach you plus some. And so what I did was, which was like, if there's one thing I did that really transformed like, you know, sales and, and getting people to write reviews is I created, I pulled out from my big community, a smaller subset that I call my DC, my dream catcher 500. So I wrote them an email. The initial email that um my copywriter wrote did not land. It was like, do you want to be on the street team to help Tiffany sell her book? Nobody cares. So I was like, I know how to copyright. So I was like, give me the copyright. I said, my book is coming out. You guys have been so awesome the last 15 years. I want to gift something to you, but there are over 2 million dream catchers worldwide and 300,000 of you on my email list. So I can't gift to everyone, but I can set aside 500 spaces in this private Facebook group where before the book comes out, you're going to get a free digital copy called the galley. I'm going to do lives with you weekly. You're going to get checklists, all these things. And, you know, just as a thank you for being here and supporting me. And certainly I would love if you could leave a review and things like that for the book when it comes out. The five, within 30 minutes, the group was filled to capacity. People were like mad, like, oh, I can't get in, you know? And then those 500 people, one, despite getting a a free digital version, bought almost 4,000 copies of the book. I couldn't believe it. I was like, and then when it was time to write reviews, because it's so critically important that when your book first comes out, that you have people who are ready to write reviews primed and ready to go. That's why we gave them the digital copy so they got time to read it. And so as soon as the, you know, the day one hit, which usually books drop on Tuesday, they flooded Amazon. And I, I, you never tell people how to review, just please review. They flooded Amazon with reviews. And that's, that got the, like the juices going. And then I emailed my list. If you read the book and you thought it was great for two weeks after, please write a review. And so we don't, I don't push reviews as much anymore because we have a decent amount. You know, now these reviews that are just rolling in are not requested, but that's how Mm. it was. It was like getting this core group of like, basically your book street team. Yeah, They wrote reviews on, if you look at Goodreads, we have a good amount of reviews. They were Mm. reviews on Goodreads. They posted on social for me. They reshared, Mm. they liked, and they wrote Amazon reviews. So that's just a great, a great way to make sure that you get a good amount of reviews going because you really want to send a signal to Amazon that this is a book that you should be promoting on my behalf. Oh yeah. That's awesome. And that's incredible. I hope you're loving this episode so far. So if you're serious about writing and publishing your book, we would love to chat with you and help create a custom plan. All right. So all you need to do right now is go to selfpublishing.com forward slash schedule, schedule a 45 minute consultation with one of the experts on my team. All right, let's implement what you're learning in this episode and let's see how we can help with your book. Go to selfpublishing.com forward slash schedule. Um, I, I, so I sent you that box. Um, in that, there should be a copy of my new book published. Um, check out, um, and either you or some, maybe someone on your marketing team, there's a chapter in here on reviews. Two mm-hmm. things you might consider. One thing we do is uh, we call it the review sweeper. Mm-hmm. Um, and so anytime someone downloads anything related to a book, it's just a follow-up email 21 days later. And mm-hmm. it's kind of like a little follow-up campaign of like, hey, what do you think mm-hmm. of the book? And when they come in or when they reply, hey, and then I'll have someone on my team say, hey, that's so amazing. Would you mind copying and pasting that here in a review at here? And okay. like that works wildly, I mean, really, really well. And then one of the things that we do um, that would probably work for you as well is uh, just a short link that's easy. Like for me, it's publishedbook.com forward slash review. Mm-hmm. So whatever your URL is forward slash review. Mm-hmm. And that redirects to the Amazon page. So it makes it super Love easy it. on a podcast, any appearances or just in a DM or someone saying, hey, I love the book saying, hey, I hey, love that. Can- you could copy and paste that here. And we've seen those two things. Uh, I love that. If you knew really me, well. I am the queen. I love a, um, a URL. Uh, like yeah. <laughs> Literally, I'm like, I buy one for everything. I'm like, mm. so I love that idea because you're right. People will say, like just every day someone posts, tags me on Instagram about the book. So if totally. I was able to say, um, you know, geekerofmoneyreview.com or budgetnisareview.com, yeah. Yeah. That's, I love that. That's actually, I love that idea. Okay, I'm going to do that. 
Cool. Awesome. I want to back up a little bit. Um, how many, you said book number seven, how many did you self-publish? How many have you traditionally published? So I've only traditionally published this, this one, and I don't know if I'll do any more. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted, I traditionally published because there was a certain, especially in the financial space, I wanted to um, garner like a certain level of respect that comes, you know, because people will say like, you know, I don't mind being called an influencer. I think I'm an educator, an influencer, an author, you know, but sometimes like, especially now these days, there's this connotation that you're not serious, you know? And I thought, okay, I knew I wanted to get a New York Times bestseller. Like that was like my aim. And I said, if I can do a book that I can work to get a, to a New York Times bestseller, and I did all this research about what it looks like to get on the list, um, and I could sell really well, that it will help to differentiate me as like this true expert in the space. And it's mm -hmm. true. Now it's almost like it being an Oscar winner. You're always going to be award Oscar award winning Tiffany Alice. And so whenever someone has me on the news, whenever they always say New York Times bestseller, Tiffany Alice is in the room. So that was one of the aims. Oh. Like, you know, cool. is that mm -hmm. I wanted that, like, especially in the finance space, it's just, you know, because anyone could just turn on their camera and just say, buy a stock, you know? Yeah. So I was just like, well, what separates me? So that was one. And two, you know, like, I just knew having a, at least one traditionally published book, like I said, in, in this finance space, I, you know, I knew that it was going to like, because no one ever talks about my other books, although they've done well. They only ever mentioned Get Good With Money. And you see Netflix, they actually asked me, can we call the, 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 the documentary Get Good With Money? I'm like, no, that's the name of my book. So they called it Get Smart With Money instead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they've never asked about my other books, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so why, um, why did you not want the Netflix documentary to have the same name? Just give, because it'd be confusing or? That's what I was worried about. Yeah. I said, if someone Googles Giga with money, you think I'm beating Netflix on the, on the algorithm? Oh, cool. So at first yeah. I was like, oh, that's great because it's going to send so many book sales my way. I'm like, is it? Mm -hmm. Maybe initially, but then Netflix will always rank first, Tiffany. Oh, because, interesting. You know, really so that's, mm -hmm. yeah. so then when they named it Get Smart With Money, it's close enough. So I still get some residual, like I, you know, I sold tens of thousands of additional books because of that, but mm -hmm. it doesn't take away from my space when people are Googling for my book. Cool. That's mm -hmm. really smart. I like mm -hmm. that a lot. So you said you may, you, you don't know if you'll traditionally publish again. What did you learn from kind of the experience of both self-publishing and traditional publishing? And how does that impact what you decide to do with your next book? Um, well, one, I learned like book writing for me. I don't consider myself an author. I'm a teacher who has something to say, you know? And so I, um, the traditionally published, you know, it's nice to have the, you know, the distribution and things like help from, from, you know, like your publisher or whatever. But I tell the joke is, is that it's a book publisher, not a bookseller. Like they're not, they're not selling any of your books. It's all you. <laughs> I tell people all the time. Like, oh. <laughs> That's good. I like that a lot. <laughs> You know, and so like the, the work like really relies on me and I can just do the work for my own book if that's what I'm wanting, you know? Um, and I, so I, I liked having, you know, cause I wanted to be in Target and Barnes and Noble. And if I'm being candid, I didn't want to do the research to try to figure out how do I do that? You know? Um, plus, like I said, it's easier. It's not impossible to get a New York Times bestseller with a self-published book, but it's very difficult. So I knew with a traditionally published book that the odds were, were higher stacked in my favor. Um, and cause I already know how to get my own press and things like that. And, but what I like about a, um, and also too, it's nice to have the editing and all that kind of stuff. But the truth is, you know, I have access to really great editors and things now. And for um, self-published books, you know, you get to keep more of the money, you know, like the yeah. work, you know, you get to mm -hmm. oh, the fruits of your labor because I got a really great book publishing deal, an excellent one, but I didn't fully understand book publishing math until I was like, I haven't paid y'all back yet after 230,000 copies. And I'm like, because I got a really good uh, deal, yeah. but yeah. like, I've already paid them back. I've already paid, they've already made, hmm, I'm just thinking maybe five or six six times more with my advance was. And I got a really good advance. Oh, wow. You know, like I, they've made millions already, you mm -hmm. know, but because you know that 15% that you get and you're paying back 15% at a time. And mm -hmm. so you you can make the million, but you've only paid back hundreds of thousands. And it's like, mm -hmm. say what now? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, don't like that. <laughs> yes. And so that, you know, there's that, but to be fair, the average person who gets an advance never pays back their, their publisher. Yeah. And so they, they rely on people like me to not only pay back my advance, but all the other people. Paying back all who the did, yes. yeah. Oh yeah. You know? And so you live in, you know, like I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I mean, my attorney to be candid was like, she didn't want me to get a traditionally published book deal. She's just like, just do it yourself. And I'm like, it's not for the money. Cause I make mm. plenty of money with the budget Nista. I have an online school, the literature Academy. Um, I have like a really great Patreon, my mentor, Tiffany.com. I have, so I make like in the last few years, we made over $30 million worth in business. So certainly my advance was not really a dent in that. It wasn't about the mm -hmm. money. It was like, I told you there was like a certain level of like, put some respect on my name that I needed the mm -hmm. book to do for me. And it's done it. And yeah. so like, if I get another New York Times bestseller, I mean, it doesn't really add. It's just like, okay, girl, you know, like, yeah. so, so we'll see. I might do, <laughs> like I'm considering doing a workbook version just because people uh -huh. have asked, but other mm -hmm. than that, and it would have to be with the same publisher because you know, they own so many of the 
rights. But other than that, I don't know that I'll do like, we'll see. You never know how how life takes me, but yeah. Yeah. Did you, did you split out your, uh, did you split out your audio book rights at all? Um, no. So it, yeah, it's all, so I do, they do have audio rights too, but it's all together. So what does that look like to split out your audio rights? Yeah. That it's, it's something that's negotiable. So I I feel like, you know, if you do decide to go traditional publishing with your next book, negotiating out your audio book rights and self, some people, I just had someone on the podcast, I feel like a few weeks ago who they negotiated out their audio book rights and Mm -hmm. self-published and they make a ton of money on their audio rights. So that's, it's definitely negotiable. Okay. Probably get a smaller advance, obviously, but then you've got good long-term upside. So Mm -hmm. it's that obviously your royalty rate, um, and, and kind of earn back of your advance. And then the third piece, um, oh gosh, I'm, I'm blanking, um, owning the IP, but I feel like there's one other thing. Oh, um, your price for author copies. Okay. It's a super small thing that not a lot of people Mm. think of, but if you want to use author copies, like in any of your speaking gigs or in any of your online courses or challenges or whatever, just negotiating that, which, you know, is kind of a line item that they don't really care a lot about when you're at the negotiating table. It's like, all right, cool. Your your price per author copy, we can drop it by a couple bucks. Okay. But, you know, there's no skin off their back because they're like, okay, how many author copies are you really going to buy? Um, but it can make a big difference if you want to do like in, in our world, uh, free plus shipping funnels and things like that, where it's like, mm. all right, we use the book to bring in customers. Yes. Um, but if that, if, if you have to buy them at retail, it can, it can make it really tough uh, to make that math work. So the audio rights, you're saying that I can literally Negotiate own my own, like, okay. Okay. Yeah. You can own your own audio book rights. They're not, they're certainly not going to like it. Right. And they're going to say, oh yeah, we don't do that. Or those aren't how we do our deals or mm-hmm. whatever else. And you'll probably get a lower advance, but mm-hmm. it is absolutely absolutely negotiable. Okay. And then too, cause you know, I know that industry standard of that 15%, you're saying that like, I can push back on that. You can, that's, that's on the higher end though, actually. I mean, we always tell people eight to 12% is okay. kind of in the range. So okay. you're, you're, it's definitely negotiable though. I mean, selling okay. like you're selling, everything's negotiable. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's one thing you can tell the way they talk to you differently. I'm like, Oh yeah. In yeah, the beginning yeah. it was kind of like, Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then it was like, wow. Cause it's still two years later, we averaged like 1500 sales a week still mm-hmm. like oh you know gosh. and so it's wow. just really cooking with grief i know mm-hmm. i'm not i'm not gonna lie at this point it's not my audience yeah. you know like one of the biggest lessons i looked i did like about a year's it's worth of research bit. yes and so one you have to write an amazing book obviously right you know i work really hard um but so something i learned from tim ferris in particular because i said i i like to look to see who has done what i want to do but it was in a similar space like you know when tim's big book um four hour work week came out he wasn't famous he wasn't so i'm like so how did he do that i remember saying i want the four hour work week like how and yeah. So he used to do a lot of interviews that I found later that I listened to all of them. I've read all the blog posts. One of the best pieces of advice that he gave, and I give to anybody who asked me about marketing their book, is that he got really clear on his guy. Like, who is the person that I'm speaking to? And he was like, yes, Silicon yes. Valley guy, 25 to 30 yep. years old. And like, let's just call him Ted. And so I said, okay, I know my girl, Tanya, yes. 25 to 45. And, and the key that is, is so to important. just talk to Tanya. Yes. Even though you yes. want Bob and Sarah and everybody yes. else. And I'm like, no, no, no. So when I, when the book came out for the first six months, I only talked to Tanya because yep. if you just talk to Tanya, you know, like there are only four podcasts that Tanya really listens to. There are only three blogs. So you don't have to spread yourself so thin. Mm. And so when my book okay. launched, Tanya was, Ty, Tanya's were literally tweeting me saying, everywhere I am, Tiffany, you are, what's happening? So it looked like, so we called it the cacophony on my, my team. I was yeah. like, we wanted that, like, um, like, I was like, I love that vocabulary word. It's like, if you go into the Amazon and you're surrounded by birds and it's literally mm. like you're inundated by sound. And so like, yeah. I wanted a cacophony when it yeah. came to the media. And so I didn't yeah. have to do nearly as many interviews. So, so uh, yeah, Tanya was my first primary audience. And what happens is Tanya's best friend is Beth and her work husband is Ted and her. So Tanya will tell oh. those people for you, yeah. you know, but you have to get her on board. And that's why now I don't have to say anything yep. because Tanya is selling to everyone else. Mm-hmm. Like the people who are getting the book now, I mean, it wasn't really um, um, like in the book, like I, the book is specifically written with like a feminine energy in mind because that's the mm-hmm. marginal my audience. But to see all these men who are hitting me up are like, I love this book because my wife never listens to me. But we sit down and read, she's like, <laughs> we sit down and read the budget these days. She's like, oh, listen to what Tiffany said. He's like, I just said that. And so, so many guys have reached out and they're just like, you know, I know it, like my one of my favorite reviews is on Audible. It's this guy, his name is Will Smith. Well, it's obviously not the Will Smith. But he says something like, even though in the book, she calls me sis because I'm like, hey, sis, in the book. And she told me, go ahead and spurs on that dress. I I love this book. <laughs> so I just thought like it's it's breaking through, yeah. not necessarily because of me marketing to, to an audience outside of Tanya, but Tanya doing the legwork. So if you can, you can empower 
and flood your audience with the tools and resources they need to share your book. Nothing grinds my gears more than when someone says, buy my book on Amazon. It's available mm -hmm. everywhere. I'm like, go mm -hmm. get the URL, getgoodmoney.com. Yes. yes. That's it. Or get good money book. Like if, if you can't get the, mm -hmm. go get the URL. So, because it's not just about allowing people to decide where they want to buy it. You are training your audience when they talk to their mom and you're not in the room. Yep. And she says, mom, you should get this book. What is it called? Get good with money. Where do I get it? Get good with money.com. Yeah. You know? And so like, that was something that was like, I, I tell all my friends, like, what are you doing? Go buy the URL. Don't send them to a budget. Lisa dot com forward slash two two nine one one one. What does that even mean? <laughs> yeah. What does that even mean? That's good. I like that a lot. Um. Well, I'm gonna go lightning fire a, a few okay. a few final questions. And and before I do though, I, I know it's kind of hard to see, but I love that. I mean, you're preaching to the choir here. Mm. We talk about the four P's of a best selling book: okay. person, pain, promise, price. Yeah. Right. And so that person, Tanya. Yes. Um, and getting super clear on that, and just writing to Tanya, talking to Tanya, doing mm -hmm. podcasts that Tanya listens to. I think that's yeah. That, that's awesome. There's three things. I mean, I feel like we could talk for hours on this stuff. This is so good. Um, there's three things I wanted to ask you about. One is the Netflix documentary. Okay. We've already talked about a little bit. Second is the quiz. Mm -hmm. uh, and the third piece is, is press and PR. Mm -hmm. you, you alluded to that earlier. You're like, oh yeah, I know how to get press. And <laughs> looking at all your stuff, I'm like, yeah, she definitely knows how to get press. <laughs> um, so maybe let's start um, Netflix documentary. How, how did you line that up? And has that been a big mover of books and stuff for your business? business or brand or not so much? Um, well, honestly, they, they came to me. I didn't know that it was a production company that did um, documentaries. They, they sent me an email, said, we're doing a documentary on money. We'd love to see be interested. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I sent the link to my one of my sisters. I'm one of five girls. And she said, oh, I love their documentaries. Like I, I'm familiar with this company. They do really great oh. ones. And that's literally the only reason why I said yes, because I was busy. And so I we started to tape. And then like a few months in, they were like, it's for Netflix. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> So they, they, they didn't that even told tell me, you that. No, they did not tell me. <laughs> Wow. I know. So I could have said no. And then later, totally. like, oh, you know, totally. so, so yeah, that's how the Netflix thing happened. And certainly it has um, raised my profile. It sold a ton of books, but I also, I did a lot of marketing for Get Smart With Money as if it was my own documentary. Uh, yep. A lot. Because I also mm -hmm. wanted Netflix to come back to me and say, we're interested in you, which they have because of oh. my marketing. And so, yeah, so, so you can squeeze more, more blood from the turnip. Mm -hmm. That's really, really smart. And so let's talk about the quiz. We, I had, um, Gary Chapman on the podcast who, who wrote a book called the five love languages. Mm, and he right. talked about the, the love language quiz. And then obviously there's strength finders. Like, and so we talk a lot about quizzes and how they're one of the best ways to turn readers into subscribers yes. and also get people to buy the book. Right. Cause yes. it kind of, it's this infinity loop of people who buy the book, take the quiz, tell their friend about the quiz, their friend takes the quiz, then they buy the book. And then they tell the, you know, it just <laughs> kind of keeps this thing going. Um, how'd you land on the quiz? Have you integrated that with, with the books at all? Absolutely. Um, how has that helped? So the book is called, um, um, the subtitle is um, 10 Steps um, to Achieving Financial Wholeness. So the quiz, um, I remember what happened was that the, the book cover was going to drop and um, my publisher was like, drop the book cover so people could be excited. But what I know as somebody who markets is you never get more excitement than the initial reveal. What will you do with that energy? You should put it somewhere. I was like, I'm not going to drop a cover. And people are like, ah, so I can get likes. Like, what does that even mean? So we dropped the cover. People are like, ah, oh, we love it. I'm like, great. Go take this 10. You know, 10 step quiz. It's just one minute long to see how financial whole you are and put it in the comments. And so I think like the first day or two, we got like 10,000 people, you know, took the quiz. And when you take the quiz in order to get yeah. your results, you got to put your name and email in. So it was like, collect. Yep. And then we added you, <laughs> we added you to like our get good with money list. Cause you're clearly interested. And at yeah. the end of the quiz, it says something to the effect, like, um, you get like this downloadable. So check your email. So that way, you know, we could be integrated into your email list. Um, and then it's a fun at the end, if you get like a, 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 a result under 60% or whatever. It's like a fun meme that says, it's okay. If you get something above 60, it says like, yay. But either way, it says at the end, if you don't have a hundred percent financial wholeness, then the book is a solution. And then there's, there's a link to get oh, the book. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we tell people like, you know, share your quiz, screenshot this and share your quiz online. And so we do that too. So the quiz, I mean, I mean, you see over oh, nearly a hundred thousand people have taken it. And so yeah. that's a hundred thousand people on my email list from this quiz. And so it's just a great wow. way to like add people to your list, get them to get the book 
book, get them to understand what the book is about. Cause these are the 10 steps that you just took and you know, mm. the 10 quiz points about, and it makes you introspective and say, wow, I don't have a budget. I don't have that. I don't. And then at the end, it's like, oh, but the book is going to help me with that. So it was super, super, super helpful. Wow. That's crazy. Um, last question or two, I guess, uh, last question. And then, uh, maybe a two-parter, um, <laughs> we're, we're right up against our time here. Um, what's, what's your secret with all this PR? <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Good morning, America. It's today show. I think <laughs> like, like all these different places. How do you yes, do it? The secret is that, um, don't turn your nose up at local, local, like, so ABC owns good morning America, but they also own your little ABC, like whatever in your city, like do those things. Because what happens is producers, no producers and producers move around. So who is like the, you know, the producer at your local ABC, you know, affiliate might one day be working at good morning America and be like, Hey, Tiffany, remember me from five years ago? You're so awesome. Come on over here. Also good morning America does not want to take a chance on someone who's going to stutter and be nervous on online. So they're going to want to see where have you been before? If you have nothing then you get nothing. So do these smaller places first so you can get comfortable. And then you have these like video clips so they can see you and say, we'd love for you to do that here. Also be active on social. So many times press has reached out to me to say, I love that thing you did on social three ways to raise your credit score. Can you come on and do that here? You know? Um, um, mm-hmm. no. And so like that helped a lot. Yeah. Like I, I got invited to the white house to watch the state of the unity address because of like some like social media post that I did about like, here's, you know, new laws that are going to help you save money or whatever. They're like, Oh, we love this. Do you want to come to the white house and watch the state of the union? I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really cool, you know? Yeah. And so so I just say all that to say your social media will also help uh, because ultimately when you go on any sort of like media platform, they're going to want you to write your own segment. Six ways to lose weight, five mm-hmm. ways to grow your hair long, two, you mm-hmm. know? And so like doing those things already and also yeah. going live. Like I was on Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, mm-hmm. you know, on Netflix, which is, that was huge. Like I didn't realize how many people watched and they found me because I was doing regular lives and they were like, wow, we can see Tiffany's cadence. We can see mm-hmm. her, how comfortable she is in front of the camera. We want her to come on. So you want to yeah. be visible. You want to do those local things and you want to be consistent. That's awesome. And then you want to pitch yourself. Use um, yeah. helpareporterout.com. That's a really great place to start to pitch. It's a really good one. Tiffany, it's been awesome. What what would be your parting piece of advice for the Tiffany from 15 years ago before your first book and the other Tiffany's out there, whether it's school teachers <laughs> or just people uh, considering writing their first book? Um, Consistency, consistency, consistency. Yeah, you're going to suck. You're supposed to. <laughs> and that over time, if you consistently show up, whether it's writing, whether it's live, social media, just consistently showing up, actively trying to learn from the times that you're not doing so well to fix, to tweak, to pivot and to get back in there. And like, you will eventually get better. Like, you know, what happens is is that the first 10 years I was not so great. And then the last five, all the lessons I learned came together. And I'm like, you know, like, like cooking with grease now. So show up consistently, consistently for yourself and your book and your project. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that too. I'm like, I thought I was the only one, either I'm the only one that said that phrase (laughs) that was like a Southern thing. <laughs> uh, but I love that. We're cooking with grease. Well, hey, how can, uh, Tiffany, how can uh, people buy your books, check out your stuff? Where's the best people or the best place for people to go um, to find out more about you and what you're up to? So if you want to get good with money, you can go to getgoodwithmoney.com. Other than that, I'm the budget Nista everywhere. TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook. Instagram's probably my favorite, thebudgetnista.com. So all those things are, and even the book, and all the books are available there too. So ultimately the budgetnista.com. Awesome. Tiffany, thank you so much. This is so thank fun. You. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode of the Self-Publishing School Podcast. I know there's so many places that you could be spending your time. There's other podcasts that you could be listening to, YouTube channels that you could be watching. So thank you so much. It means the world. Now I want you to do three things right now if you found this episode helpful. I don't know if you know this, but we've got a YouTube channel. It's a companion channel to this podcast. All the video versions of the episode are on the YouTube channel. So number one, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Number two, if you're listening to this podcast, wherever, whether this is Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Number two, I want you to subscribe to this podcast right now so you don't miss a future episode. And then number three, this is probably the most important, leave a review on the podcast. All right, reviews are super important and help this podcast get discovered by other people. So number three, leave a review on the podcast. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next episode.